The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all those who are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Some of you may be feeling liturgically out of place, uh, both because the Lenten study is starting before Lent and because I just prayed the collect for Lent, uh, and we're not even in Lent. But as you will see, uh, we are preparing for Lent, and the collect uh, synchronizes or syncs very nicely with uh, Father Thornton's book and with what we're going to talk about tonight. So I wanted to set that up as kind of a introduction. What we're studying today, uh, tonight, and for the rest of Lent, or for Lent, I should say, since we're not actually in it, is The Purple-Headed Mountain by Father Martin Thornton. Father Thornton was a Church of England priest in the 20th century. He was one of the uh, great Anglican theologians of the last century, and he focused in particular on spiritual direction and spiritual formation. And this is his application of spiritual formation to uh, Lent specifically. So it is a wonderful little volume from a great, sometimes forgotten, thinker of the last century who's worth revisiting. It's called The Purple-Headed Mountain, and if you look at your handout, you can see the quote that I pulled from the foreword by Archbishop Michael Ramsey at the top there. And Ramsey says that according to The Purple-Headed Mountain, or in The Purple-Headed Mountain, the calling of a Christian is likened to the climbing of a mountain, purple-headed because the way of ascent is the way of penitence. This notion that the Christian life is climbing a mountain is an ancient and venerable notion in the Christian faith and in the scriptures, dating at least as far back. I didn't I didn't take a long time to see if it goes further. So one of you can correct me if I'm if I'm missing something earlier, but at least goes as far back as Moses on Mount Horeb encountering the burning bush. And Mount Horeb is where Elijah later encounters God in the still small voice, in the whisper, if you remember. God was not in the earthquake or the fire, but he was in the whisper. And so Mount Horeb, which, uh, which the book of 2 Kings refers to as the Mount of God, is where Moses and Elijah both encounter the living God. Moses, later on Mount Sinai, uh, goes up on the mountain and feasts and sees God along with the 70 elders. If you remember that from our Lenten study last year, Jesus in the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. So Moses twice ascends a mountain and has an encounter with the living God. And of course, these are all foreshadowings or anticipations of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, where he is flanked by the two people who met him on the mountain, Moses and Elijah. Isn't that amazing? I just read somebody, I don't actually think this works, but I read somebody suggesting that Elijah on Mount Horeb and Moses on Mount Horeb were actually having the transfiguration experience that the disciples see taken out of time and, uh, and place and brought up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. There's nothing in the Bible that suggests that that's the case, but it's really cool. So, and I'm not sure that there's anything that contradicts it necessarily. You get into some weird mind bending time space paradoxes, but anyway, I'm sure that um, who's the guy who did the uh, Inception movie? He could do a cool movie about that. I don't know. All right, and all of those. Moses and Elijah on Mount Horeb, Moses on Mount Sinai, Jesus and his disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, all of those are foreshadowings of Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem where we will enjoy the beatific vision of, vision of God forever. And so this notion that, that Christian formation, Christian life is an ascent up a mountain where we will perceive the face of God is not only very venerable in Christian history, but it's, it's a theme that's shot through the scriptures. For Martin Thornton, the way that we ascend the mountain is primarily through prayer. Probably the, the, the simplest, best definition of prayer is the lifting up of the heart and mind to God. And so just as you lift up your heart and mind to God in prayer, that brings you up the mountain closer to God. But because we live in the, in the aftermath of sin, we must do it through penitential prayer. That is, through cleansing, through, through the um, purposeful fighting against sin and temptation. And so prayer and penitence for Martin Thornton are the two ways that we ascend the mountain to be with God. And so then, so thus you have a purple-headed mountain, a penitential mountain, because purple is the color of penitence. 
So those are two of the three themes of this book, prayer and penitence. And the third theme, which is really not so much a separate theme as rather something that infuses the other two themes, is the theme of creation. Thornton points out that prayer and penitence can become these very uh, internal, individualistic, abstract, not practical forms of, of spirituality when they're understood wrongly. So prayer and penitence become this kind of like escape from the world, escape from your everyday interactions, and becomes a kind of practical Gnosticism, a denial of our Im embeddedness and embodiedness in the world. And so Thornton wants to correct that by saying that we have to have a really powerful doctrine of creation in order to rightly understand prayer and penitence. And, and the way that this works out for him is that th this ascent up the mountain is not an escape from creation. It's actually a deeper dive into the reality of creation because we were created to ascend the mountain ultimately. We were created to, 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 to experience the beatific vision not by nature, but by grace. But grace, as he, as he is so quick to emphasize, grace perfects our created nature. It doesn't destroy it. And so, when, and so he says that prayer and penitence, rightly understood, are actually uh, tangible and embodied. They're a deeper journey into creation, not an escape from creation. When we are prayerfully penitent, we become who we are made to be, who we were originally created to be. We become not less embodied, but more authentically embodied, more authentically who we are called to be. And so there you see the second quote on the sheet there, which is from Thornton himself. He says, spirituality then is simply the art of living, the art of being human, fully, deeply, and perfectly. Christian spirituality is not a rejection of embodiment. It's rather the sort of culmination and completion of embodiment. It's not uh, disembodied, but rather embodied. So what he does in this book is he looks at prayer and penitence through the lens of creation. This is not a systematic book. He is not systematically outlining uh, Christian living in a sort of step-by-step -step process. He actually has a book that's like that, which he mentions. And it's called Christian Proficiency. It's a wonderful little book. And if you want the kind of step-by-step -step guide, here's what it looks like to live as a Christian in the Anglican tradition, this is probably the best thing you can get for that. This is not that book. This is almost like this book uh, put in a blender and, and, and considered devotionally through the practices of Lent. So it's more episodic and devotional in some ways than it is systematic. It's devotional and pastoral reflections about it, what, it, what it looks like to live as a Christian during Lent. He assumes, though, part of, part of the reason for the lack of systematic, uh, of it being a systematic thing, is that he assumes his audience are faithful Anglicans. And so he assumes, uh, this was again written back in the 1960s, he assumes a level of familiarity with an Anglican rule of life and with the Lenten disciplines of fasting, almsgiving, and prayer uh, that may have been valid at the time and probably is valid for a lot of you, but is not, nece not necessarily as universally the case as it was then. Does that make sense? He, he assumed his audience sort of already understood a lot of things. And so as he goes through it, if you don't have a background to understand what he's talking about, you can get a little bit lost. So the reason that I wanted to start before Lent was for a couple reasons. One is I wanted to give a quick overview of, in Martin Thornton's thinking, what does an Anglican rule of life look like? And what does personal prayer look like? And what do the traditional Lenten disciplines of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving look like uh, to Thornton so that you have kind of a framework for it? And then I wanted to encourage all of us together to embark upon these disciplines and practices because this is not a book that, uh, that does well if it's just a sort of abstract study divorced from your daily life. And he wouldn't want it to work well that way. It's supposed to be in conversation with your practice of those Lenten disciplines and your practice of an Anglican rule of life. And so I want to encourage, we're not gonna stand up and say a pledge or anything like that, but I want to encourage you all to consider what forms, uh, what Lenten disciplines uh, do you want to take on? And I'll encourage you in a few different directions in that way. And then on Sunday, in, when you get the bulletin insert, it's the same bulletin insert you, you see, you've been seeing for a number of years. It's nothing new, newly created. It's just the same venerable thing. Uh, you will have some framework for thinking about what you want to commit to. All right, so if you look at the schedule there, next week, next Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We won't meet 
So we'll meet again on Lent 1, March 9th, and that's good because I'm going to suggest, I'll talk about this more, I'm going to suggest that you take the next week and you read the whole book. It's only 94 pages, so you could do 20 pages a day and be done in five pages. And then I'm going to suggest that you take the week after Ash Wednesday and you go back and you read the preparatory material in chapter one. It really is not a particularly difficult book, but there are some stumbling blocks and some things that can kind of get in the way. So I'm going to encourage you to read quickly that first time and not get caught up on whether you're understanding X, Y, and Z or not. And then go back and read a little more carefully with the uh, reading guide with some guided questions. And in here I'll occasionally put in some definitions or I'll direct you to definitions in case you get lost. And if you look at the, so there's the, there's the reading that's due for each week and then there's a special topic. Essentially the way we're going to do this is we're going to take different elements of prayer, of an Anglican rule of prayer life, and the different elements of Lent and disciplines, and we're going to break them up and deal with and, and focus in on some of them during some weeks. But we're going to talk about all of them in brief tonight. Does that make sense? So we'll briefly go over the whole thing, and then we'll hit them as they come up and are relevant in the book each week. You'll also note that on Lent 3, we'll have a special guest speaker. That's Father Matthew Dahlman, who is the, wrote the new introduction to the book. He got this one republished. It had fallen out of print. He's the founder of an institute called Akenside Institute, which has Akenside Press. He says the mission of Akenside Press is the renewal of Catholic reality in Anglican parish life. He's actually uh, an Episcopal priest in New Smyrna Breach. We're bringing him in as an expert on Father Martin Thornton, which he is. And so we're bringing him in for that, for that expertise. So it is, uh, it'll, be, it'll, it'll be a wonderful thing to be able to have him. He, he knows as much about Martin Thornton as any living person in the world, probably. Um, so he's a great person to bring in for this. So what I want to do is I want to talk about Lenten disciplines and an Anglican rule of life tonight. We've got about 40 minutes to do it. That should be plenty. That's excellent. So as you all know, Father Ralph and I are always just locked in on the exact same wavelength. We're just always mind melded, never any differences. We always just think the same thing. We complete each other's sentences. But even so, even given that, I was, I was sort of surprised. Well, so I should say that I was, as you all probably know, or most of you know, I was gone this Sunday because I was on the ski trip. And Father Ralph took the adult forum class and he went through the uh, Jewish roots and Christian expressions of Lent. Then he gave, he gave me his notes. We had talked about it briefly before just to kind of get a sense of, so I would know what he was going to do as I was prepping for, for tonight so we could kind of work together. But we hadn't talked about it very much at all. And as I was reading through his notes, I was really taken aback by how perfectly in sync they were with what I wanted to talk about, of course, <laughs> naturally, and, and with, with how Thornton approaches, approaches Lent. I'm not going to repeat all of that. You can corner him on Sunday and make him give you the whole thing back again if you didn't, uh, you didn't get it the first time. But I do want to hit on some things that draw out some of the themes that he brought up and how well they fit with uh, Martin Thornton's vision of Lent and disciplines. So in brief, and, and despite the fact that we're always on the same page, if you, if you need to correct me, Father Ralph, you can, as I summarize a little bit here. <laughs> so as I understood it, as I read through the notes, what, what Father Ralph talked about was how Adam's, and Adam's temptation, Adam and Eve's temptation in the garden provided a sort of foreshadowing or a mirror image of Christ's temptation in the wilderness. And so as Adam and Eve were tempted by uh, good food that was a delight to the eyes and that would make one, a man wise, Jesus's temptations in the 40 days provided a mirror image. And as Christ so often does in the Gospels, he relives the story of Israel, the story of God's people, but he completes or corrects or, or reconciles what went wrong before. And so, you know, it, during Epiphany, we talked about he escapes to Egypt and then he returns from Egypt in a sort of echo or mirror of the, the Israelite sojourn in Egypt and return. And so likewise, Jesus, when he, when he enters into the temptation in the wilderness, he is quite uh, deliberately reversing Adam's fall into temptation. And so in the same ways that Adam is tempted, Jesus is tempted, but where Adam fell, Jesus succeeds. And so we likewise, when we resist temptation, we get to partake of Jesus's victory. And when we do that, this I think is the most amazing part, then we help participate in the rolling back of the curse. 
That is, as we participate in Christ, in resisting temptation, we heal the wounds of the fall, which is a pretty remarkable thing. Jesus lets us participate in that with him. And when you, when you, the, the way that, uh, that Father Ralph broke down the three temptations that they both faced, they were temptations related to pleasure, possessions, and pride. It's always nice to get a little alliteration there. Good food that was a delight to the eyes that would make a man wise. And uh, we can connect these also to the three traditional enemies of the Christian faith which are the world, the flesh, and the devil. Pleasures linked to the flesh, possessions linked to the world, and pride linked to the devil, since it was pride that caused Satan to fall. If you uh, notice the Sunday gospel reading, the, the parable of the sower likewise highlighted these three enemies of the flesh. The seed, the, the seed that falls, some, uh, the, some on the rock springs up, but, but when, it un- when the seed undergoes temptation, the person falls away from faith, so the temptations of the flesh. The other seed springs up and is choked out by the weeds, which Christ says are the uh, cares and pleasures and worries of this world, of this life. And so uh, this sense of the world sort of choking out your faith And he begins by saying that that which falls on the hard ground, the birds snatch up. Well, that's the devil coming and snatching away uh, a person's faith. And so the the world, the flesh, and the devil are embedded in the parable of the sower as well. And they're embedded in the temptation of Adam when Adam falls. And they are what what, uh, Satan uses to tempt Jesus, but when Jesus does not fall. And, of course, the three Lenten disciplines of fasting, almsgiving, and prayer are responses to these three enemies and their responses to these three sort of primal temptations. And so, fasting is, uh, we we fast in order to rightly direct our desires so that our pleasures are rightly ordered to to Christ. And so we we deny the flesh understood in in the negative sense. Just to be clear, the world and the flesh in the Bible are used positively and negatively. Uh, when, when John 1 tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that flesh is not bad. That's just human, uh, human flesh. And when John 3.16 tells us God so loved the world, the world is not bad. Uh, the world is God's good creation he loves. But the Bible and the Christian tradition also use these, the flesh as separate from creation. The flesh as an end unto itself. The flesh as a sort of disordered desires uh, divorced from God. And likewise, the world as an end unto itself, when you turn and you pursue the world apart from God. So just to be clear, the world and the flesh are not necessarily bad. You have to look at the, uh, the usage in the Bible to see. So fasting is a way of, of controlling and rightly directing the flesh and combating the flesh in the sense of the flesh being, being evil. Likewise, almsgiving, giving your money away, is a rejection of the world uh, in, in, because you are taking the thing that the world pursues most and you are having less of it. You are willfully, uh, willfully casting it aside. And so almsgiving rejects the temptation of the world by giving away your possessions, quite literally. And prayer, among other things, is a spiritual combat against the devil. The devil can't, uh, can't gain a foothold in your life when your mind is lifted up to God. And so fasting combats uh, the flesh and the temptation of pleasure. Almsgiving combats the world and the temptation of possessions. And prayer combats the devil and the temptation of pride. You also, pride turns you in on yourself and prayer turns you outward, right? Uh, and so, so prayer is, is, is in, in a sense, the best combat against pride. What I think is, mo- is, is critically important to understand in the Genesis story and in, and in the human story is that, as Father Ralph pointed out, pleasure, possessions, well, maybe not pride, uh, pri- uh, 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 um, wisdom, uh, right? Is Satan says, ye shall be as gods, and Eve looks at the fruit and says, ah, the fruit will make us wise. That desire to be like God and to be wise, that's actually good, as is... Uh, as is beauty, when, he, when they say it, it, it is a delight to the eyes, and as is good food. And so what's, what's so interesting about the temptation story, 
is that what Satan offers to Adam and Eve is actually what God has already intends for Adam and Eve, but he offers them a shortcut to getting it. And he offers them a way of getting it for themselves, closing in on themselves, pursuing something that's good, but apart from God. And so the most sort of interesting thing is that everything Satan offers to Adam and Eve is already their birthright. They just don't know it yet. And if they would be patient and humble and trust in God, then they would have received it anyway, right? And of course, that's the story of, of, the, of, of Jesus' temptation. It's, you know, of course, it's almost amusing. Bow down to me and worship you, and I'll, I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth. Well, this is the, you're, you're asking the king of kings, you're offering the king of kings his kingdom. There's an absurdity built into it. But it was absurd when, when Satan offered it to Adam as well, but Adam didn't have eyes to see that. And so fasting, almsgiving, and prayer ultimately are not negatively oriented. They are not simply a rejection of the world, the flesh, and the devil. They're actually positively oriented. And so, and so they're oriented not necessarily individually, but collectively they are oriented towards goodness, truth, and beauty, as Father Ralph pointed out. We, we fast from food, not because food is bad, but actually because it's good. It should be, it should, it's important to note that, that during Lent and at all times, you fast from good things, not bad things. Otherwise, you'd be feasting on bad things afterwards, right? Yeah. People would be like, oh, I'm fasting from cruelty. What are you going to do on Easter? <laughs> That's a problem. So, so you don't fast bad things. You just give them up. You don't fast from them because then we, anyway. And so we fast from, food, from, from good things, actually. And actually, ultimately, we fast in order to eat well. And ultimately, we do that by eating what Jesus refers to as true food and true drink, which is his body and his blood. The reason we eat ultimately is so that is is, is as a way of understanding the Eucharist in the in the in the economy of the kingdom of heaven. The body and blood of Jesus are, in fact, the truest food, as as Jesus says in John six. And so all food then then rightly ordered becomes a way of understanding the Eucharist. And so we fast from certain foods so that we can feast ultimately on the body and blood of Jesus. And all feasting then, rightly understood, then becomes this uh, anticipation and overflow of the Eucharistic feast. And, and likewise, we reject, we, we cast aside our alms, not, not so we cast aside our money in almsgiving, not so much because money itself is, is evil, but because it ties us to the, a, an economy of this world at times that can distract us from the economy uh, in heaven. And so we actually tithe ultimately to store up treasure, right? Uh, do not store up treasure on earth where thieves break in and steal, uh, but on, in heaven, right? We, that's one of our, one of our um, offertory sentences that we say. So we actually give away alms to store up treasure, but it's heavenly treasure. Jesus offers his followers a crown, and he offers them, in fact, a kingdom. And so uh, and so the, the possessions in the world, we don't cast aside, we actually come into them as, as, as joint heirs, fellow heirs with Christ, and, and we, we rule the world with Christ. And so we're actually offered the world as, as something that we can rule over with Christ. Does that make sense? So ultimately, almsgiving is not a rejection of the world or a rejection of possession. It's casting aside the illusion of possession, because money and, and American property law, which is not necessarily bad, but you start to think that you own this piece of property because, you know, the, the Seminole County says you do, as opposed to it being God's, which he has loaned you as a steward to use well, right? And so in almsgiving, we reject the sort of false notions of ownership the world has in light of the true ownership of the world by Jesus Christ. And likewise, in prayer, we combat pride, and as we pray, we become deified. We become like God. We become, as Second Peter one four says, we become partakers of the divine nature. So we pray to become like God. So in each of these, each of these Lenten disciplines, we do so not to reject things ultimately, but as a positive pursuit of other things. We're not simply rejecting pleasure, possessions, and wisdom. We are, are rightly understanding our place. And we aren't, we don't grovel in a kind of false humility as though we're like terrible people, 
we recognize the true, tr humility is recognizing your true worth, which is in Christ, not in your own sort of personal talents and accomplishments. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't then manifest itself as some sort of like false humility that pretends you're not good at things you are good at, right? And so, so uh, through prayer, we actually become elevated and more glorified, not debased and humiliated. All of this then ties back to this notion that creation, that, that, that the, the Christian life is a life of completing creation, that the grace of God perfects and completes creation. And so when we live as Christians, we live as our authentic selves. We learn to flourish as authentic uh, image bearers of God. Does that make sense? So that as it turns out, at the end of the day, Christian spirituality is simply an embrace of ourselves as created. It's, it's, a, it's a living out of the vocations that God has, has gifted us with in creation. And so when we do these things, fasting, almsgiving, and prayer, we are learning to live as we were created to live. So these three things, fasting, almsgiving, and prayer, um, you can, again, you can learn more about them in this Lenten rule booklet. If you have more questions, I'm not going to go too into depth about the, pra the, the practical nuts and bolts of those. Um, and, and there will also be some guidance in the bulletin as well on Sundays. Um, but if you have more questions about them, I'm happy to answer. I, I answer them as well. These three practices, though, Martin Thornton is assuming that you are doing them in connection with a broader Anglican rule of life. That is to say that you are not just picking these three di disciplines and doing them absent any connection to the church or absent any connection to, to faith outside of that. In Father Wilcox's piece, he mentions the, uh, a agnostic he runs into who's giving up chocolate for Lent, but doesn't go to church and doesn't believe it's connected to anything. And he says, whatever she's doing, it's not Lent. <laughs> she's not doing the church's Lent, right? Not maybe, maybe good, maybe bad, but it's not, it's not Lent. It's something else entirely. And so within a Christian life, then, you practice the Lenten disciplines within what we call a rule of life. Rule sounds, I don't know, harsh, like, like the rules, you know, that kind of thing. But rule, just, just in this case, it, it just means a pattern of life. So all it is is an organized pattern of life. You should not so much see, like, you know, images of, mean school teachers making you follow the rules as much as it is having a schedule and having a, 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 an organized life and committing to certain things. And so a rule of life is consciously thinking about, well, how do I live as a Christian in this world? And a classic Anglican, the, the, cla the classic Anglican rule of life basically consists of three to four things. It's four, but not everybody loves the fourth one. The first one is the Sunday Eucharist, the Mass. So the, the central building block of an Anglican, Anglican rule of life is Sunday communion. And that's, that's, uh, that's the sort of um, the basic part of a, a rule of life collapses if it's not connected to the Sunday Eucharist. You might as well just not do anything if you're neglecting the Sunday Eucharist, right? Uh, obviously, there are, you know, qual uh, uh, qualifications and exemptions and uh, exemptions, not the right word, you know what I mean? Complicating factors that we've learned a lot about in the last two years. But nevertheless, a dedication to the weekly mass as the basic duty of a Christian is the sort of foundational element of, of rule. I I and this doesn't mean that you make it every Sunday. It means to have a rule of life is not to perfectly fulfill a rule of life. I should say that, too. To have a rule of life is to have a pattern that you are committed to following, and you only cease to have it when you are no longer committed to doing it. Does that make sense? So missing church does not mean you don't have a rule of life. It means that you, you didn't fully you know, follow every aspect of, of your rule of life. But that's pretty, that's normal. Um, if you missed you know, Sunday communion because you were so busy having a fight with your neighbor uh, that you lost track of time and then you were, you know, couldn't get there because the police were dragging you off, then you should, <laughs> then you should confess that. But, but in general, the, the, the image of a rule of life is that you are committed to something and you choose to do it. And when you don't, then you resolve to, to do better next time. Does that make sense? That's what a rule of life looks like. And you only cease to have one when you decide you're, you're done trying, right? Well, I'm just not going to do that anymore. Well, now you don't have a rule. 
but you could miss church, you shouldn't, but you could miss church 10 weeks in a row, and each week resolve to go next week, and you would still have a rule. You'd have a bad rule, or you wouldn't have a bad rule. You'd have a good rule badly followed. Um, but you would still have a rule. The second building block of an Anglican rule of life is the daily office of morning and evening prayer, where things get a little tougher, a little harder to, uh, to, to, to commit to. Father Thornton, you know, th this is the second building block. So one way to think about it is, if you're not, if you're not getting to church regularly on Sunday, uh, somebody may, <laughs> there's a lot of people in here with callers who, who might think, this is bad advice. So you tell <laughs> them it's bad advice. If you're not getting to church regularly on Sunday, don't bother with anything else. Just make it, uh, he disagrees. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it hyperbolically and then I'll correct myself. That should be your number one goal. And if anything else is distracting your attention from that, then that's a distraction. If, if, if you're managing to, to pull off the daily office, but, but you're missing Sunday service, that's something is really, some, something is out of whack there. You should make the mass your number one priority. And not when you've achieved it perfectly by any stretch of the imagination, but, but, but then you should, go, you should do the daily office too. Does that make sense? Um, so that's why it's number two. It really is, in a certain sense, in a ranking of orders of importance. That's not to say if you miss Sunday church that you should be like, well, I guess I don't have to do the daily office this week because I <laughs> already messed that up. Father Mark said we don't have to do it anymore. No, it just, it just means that your number one priority really is the Mass, and that having mastered that, you don't say, okay, well, now I'm done then you press on to the daily office. I will say, so that the daily office, daily office of morning and evening prayer that you can find starting on page, I think, three of your prayer book is wonderful and you should do it. If you have never done it or if you struggle with it, the, the prayer book offers you some less rigorous alternatives when you're short on time or short on willpower. And I'll just make sure you know that if you don't know already. 587 through following, uh, 587 and following, provides a family order for morning prayer and a family order for evening prayer. The, the real, the, the full thing, I should say the real thing, the full thing on pages three and following, it, it takes about 15 minutes if you're just saying it. Depending on how you're doing it, it can take, you know, up to 30 minutes. The 587 one is about seven to 10 minutes, depending on how you do it. So it's shorter. It could be done very quickly. <laughs> So four to 10 minutes, depending on how you're doing. <laughs> and then, and then, <laughs> and then there's the short, short form. Actually, I like to call it the short, 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 short form because you can make the other form shorter. The shortest form is on page 592. And that is the Lord's Prayer. It's a one collect and the grace, basically. It's three prayers. It's two minutes. You can add in, it's really, it's one minute. It really is. Uh, you can add in the call to the day and make it four prayers. Woo, 33% uh, longer. <laughs> Any human being on earth could do that at least 360 days out of the year, could pull off the short, short form. There is, you might forget, of course, but there's not, there's, there are almost no days in your life where you actually couldn't find 90 seconds to pray the short, short form, right? You just don't because you forget or because it's a low priority. So in that sense, there's, there's, no, there's no good excuse for not doing at least the short, short form. So if you're not doing anything, commit to doing the short, short form. Pray those three prayers. And you'll also find that after doing it, well, you are, hopefully you already have the Lord's Prayer memorized, right? And you'll find after doing it that you've got the whole thing, minus the call to the day, memorized probably by midweek you, if you're doing it every day, because it's very, very short, very easy. So... I, I think what I want to, to, to suggest here is not a, um, a kind of like be satisfied with, with some, a bare minimum, but rather a trajectory. That is, you should be on a trajectory of growth in prayer and growth in holiness. So if you're not going to Mass on a mostly weekly basis, start going to Mass on a mostly weekly basis. If you're not praying anything on a daily basis, pray the short, 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 short form on a daily basis. And, but don't be satisfied with that. Then try to start praying the short, short form, or at least, uh, at least one time on a day. Does that make sense? So you want to be essentially building your attention and prayer muscles and adding more into it. And hopefully then you will find that 
it's, it's not too difficult to do the full daily office as well. I, I, um, you know, I, I still struggle at times to keep up with the daily office, but it is absolutely doable. And I personally found that I, it wasn't until I made a Lenten resolution that said, I'm, just, I'm going to pray the daily office, morning and evening prayer, every day during Lent, no matter what, which you know, at, at times meant 12, 15 a.m. finishing evening prayer, that kind of thing. That was the, that was, it, I had to make that commitment to myself, and then I found that I could actually get into a rhythm and do it pretty easily. So I would encourage you to make some commitment like that. If it's not the full daily office, then at least commit over Lent to, to praying the short, short form. So pillar one, the mass. Pillar two, daily office. Pillar three is personal prayer. So one and two, numbers one and two, are what we would call common prayer. It's common prayer, not because it's like average, all over the place, just running into this kind of prayer everywhere you go, it's common, you know. It's not that. It's common because it's communal. It's corporate. We pray it together in common. And personal prayer, then, is pray, prayer that you pray personally by, by yourself. So the, the, the daily office is common prayer even when you say it alone, because you aren't actually saying it alone. You're saying it in concert with the whole church. And actually, that's true of pr- personal prayer, too. In personal prayer, you are, you are still praying in common with the church, uh, but you're not, you're not, reading a, uh, you're not using a, a common liturgy that's used by, by other Christians necessarily. But you're still praying as a member of a body. Does that make sense? Not as an isolated individual. Personal prayer, uh, we're going to run through fairly quickly. There's a million different sort of schemes of personal prayer. And uh, a lot of them are good. Some of them are not. But most of them actually are, are most of them are, are pretty good or, or at least pretty harmless in some cases. But, but there are a lot of different ways to pray personally. And there is not really like one magic bullet that everybody should pray together. Common prayer is common. And you, if you don't, I mean, if you don't like the mass, well, it doesn't minister, it doesn't like minister to my heart. Well, too bad. Change your heart. <laughs> it needs, it needs to minister to your heart. If you're not feeling it, that's okay. You shouldn't like rely on the feelings. That's okay. You just, but you need to keep doing it, right? Personal prayer has a much more flexibility because it is intended to be personal. It doesn't mean you, you still have to commit as a discipline to some forms of personal prayer. You shouldn't expect a sort of easy, like, spiritual payoff. You shouldn't really expect any spiritual payoff. The point is not, is what you're offering to God, not necessarily feelings you're receiving in return. So you want to commit to it. But on the other hand, personal prayer is, is personal, and, and there's a great deal of flexibility within that. And there's lots of traditions, East and West, about how to do personal prayer. I want to offer you uh, what Martin Thornton alludes to in this book, but doesn't, I want to offer you his sort of vision for personal prayer, because he's alluded, he alludes to it, but he doesn't describe it. If you want him to describe it, then you can read Christian Proficiency. That's where he tells you what he's talking about. Here, he just sort of alludes to it. So I do want to describe that for you, and that's just about the last thing we're going to do. Personal prayer, as I said, this is, this is just Father Thornton's particular scheme. It's not like the only way of doing it, but it, it does have some common um, threads that are pretty widespread. Okay, so the first thing that, uh, that we want to address here is what he calls recollection. This is a extremely widespread practice. It's not always called recollection. I can't remember the other names for it. It's very similar to if any of you have read Brother Lawrence's Practicing the Presence of God. His, it's a constant recollection. Recollection is recollecting yourself in the presence of God. And all that means is it is reminding yourself of who God is and who you are in relation to him. And the way to do it best or the, the, just a, common, a, very, a very normal, a uh, frequent way of doing that is simply choosing some sentence that reminds you of that. And so uh, many Anglicans will use St. Thomas's, not St. Thomas Aquinas, but St. Thomas the Apostle's declaration upon seeing the risen Christ, my Lord and my God. So you've got five words there. So you recollect yourself before God, my Lord and my God. God is your Lord and he is your God. And so it's, it's just that sentence that you pray in your head to recollect yourself before God. The Eastern Orthodox will say the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy, of, Lord Jesus Christ, son of... Yeah, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. The psalmist, the, the psalmist declaration from, from God, be still and know that I am God, right? These are short sentences, easily memorizable, that remind you of who God is and who you are in relation to him. The, the way to practice recollection 
is you take a deep breath, you let out the deep breath, you say the sentence in your head, you take another deep breath, and then that's it. You can include, which I do recommend, uh, if you have time, you can include a kind of 30 second quiet meditation after saying the sentence in your head, where you, were, where you sort of just quiet yourself before God. But it can be really as simple as five seconds where you say, my Lord and my God. And recollection is something that's really, really uh, a, a wonderful thing to do throughout your day. To try to find, I'm, to decide, I'm going to do this five times a day, or I'm going to do this three times a day, or even I'm just going to do this at lunch. Before I pray over my food, I'm actually going to recollect myself. And, and I find it extremely beneficial. When I was teaching, I would do it at the bells. And then I made my kids do it at the bells too, which was great. So it turned, because we had this really awful bell. I won't try to do an impression of it because it's terrible. And, it would every, and I, I got to where I just hated the bell. And then when I started do, practicing recollection, eventually I actually was looking forward to the bell because that was the time when we were all going to quiet ourselves before God. And so it sort of transformed my experience of those terrible bells. So that's recollection. And it's, it's very basic, very, a very quick way of reminding yourself of who you are in light of God, in, in, the, in the presence of God. The second one he calls mental prayer. It's probably more commonly, this is uh, various forms of meditation would count as mental prayer and contemplative prayer, depending on how it is, is, is a form of mental prayer. For Father Thornton, this most commonly involves reflecting on a story from the Gospels in prayer. And so um, at the youth retreat last fall, we took uh, Jesus's interaction with his first disciples where they start to follow him in the Gospel of John in the first chapter, I think, and they say, and uh, Jesus turns and says, what seek ye? And they say, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? And he says, come and see. And so, and then in light of John 1, they ask, where, they ask, where are you staying? And he says, come and see. And they go and they see his apartment. But John 1 has already told us that his true dwelling place is the bosom of the Father. And so the first thing Jesus does in the Gospel of John is he invites disciples to come and see his dwelling place in the bosom of the Father. And so we reflected on that little nine word, what seek ye, where dwellest thou, come and see, that nine word interaction as Christ's invitation to us to join him in the bosom of the Father. And so mental prayer, you, 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 can, you can do that with that. You can do that with any scene in the Gospels with Christ. You essentially imagine the scene, and then you imagine yourself in it. And as he says, one of the most, as he's going to say, one of the most pernicious things he thinks that's happened is that people have mistaken that sort of mental prayer, meditative prayer, as a form of Bible study. And so they're trying in their head to get all the sort of historical critical things correct. Like, oh, would Jesus have had that look on his face? Well, I don't know. Let's get back into the text. He says, no, 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 no. These are separate things. Yes, do your Bible study. Understand the scriptures at a real depth. Go to, you know, adult forum. Go to Sunday school. And then when you pray, allow your mind a relatively uh, free reign creatively. Just don't, just remember that, that when you do that, what you've come up with is, is not necessarily canonical scripture. So just because it came into your mind while you were praying doesn't mean that you should write it down and put it in a book and sell millions of copies of it, but whatever. But that, that practice of, of, allowing, uh, of allowing your imagination to, to engage the scene as it was and to imagine yourself in it and to imagine Christ in it is a wonderful form of mental prayer. It's a wonderful form of understanding who Jesus is. And all prayer has to be based on who Jesus is, ultimately. Other ways we can do it, you can do it, is a very related would be Lectio Divina, the sort of reflecting on a passage of scripture. Father Ralph has taught on that uh, in the past. You can, do, uh, I, you can do contemplative prayer with icons. Uh, if you do that, you want to know a little bit about the icons and a, and a, little, and a, a good bit about the biblical story that it's presenting. Um, otherwise, it can just be sort of a random, very random experience, but, but you can do that as well. The point here, though, is to have an imaginative, biblically-based encounter with Jesus. That's the point. The third thing he calls colloquy. I do not know anyone else who uses that phrase, um, but, but he does, that word. And this is what you would see as like the Acts prayer. You guys know what I'm talking about? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Yeah, okay. So this is the kind of the prayer where you worship God, you adore God, you thank God, you confess your sins, and you ask him for things. Um, supplication is sometimes broken into 
petition for yourself and intercession for others. Th this colloquy is, is, is what I grew up learning in the evangelical world. And you, again, this is something you find across the traditions East and West. Forms of prayer that are broken down into adoring God for who he is, thanking him for what he does, confessing your sins before him, petitioning him for your own needs and interceding for others. You're gonna find in every Christian tradition and in every era of the church. Just, just described differently. But I put down his phrase, colloquy, because he uses it in here. And if you don't already know what it is, you're not gonna know what it is. So, so there you go. Uh, there's also a night, sort of nightly self-examination that you can do that would be sort of a, a, a preface to colloquy. That's, that's often recommended either before or after evening prayer, um, usually before, I suppose you spend a couple of minutes examining your day and considering what, what are the things that you've done that you shouldn't have done and what are the things you left undone that you should have done. So a Anglican rule of life is the one I erase, the mass, the daily office, and then some regular exercise of personal prayer. And that can look as, as, as simple as saying, I'm going to do recollection at lunch and I'm going to do five minutes of mental prayer once a week and five minutes of, of, of something like colloquy once a week as well. And that, that is, that is a, a, your Anglican rule of life. But every Anglican rule of life, every healthy Anglican rule of life should have those three building blocks ultimately. Again, you might work up to them if, if, you're, if you're not doing any of them particularly well. But ideally you want the mass, you want the daily office, and then personal prayer built on those other two. Not personal prayer <coughs> in place of those, but a personal prayer life that is flowing from the common prayer that you have together. And then, number four, uh, is confession. I'm not gonna get, uh, we don't have time to get into the weeds and I don't really want to get into the weeds of confession. He will talk about it uh, in, in here as well. We'll talk about it on Lent three. But a, a, a practice of sacramental confession is a very good, very good Lenten practice. So the sacramental confession to a priest. Our booklet, our, our pamphlet that you'll see on Sunday recommends uh, doing it twice during Lent. Um, that's, that's common or, or at least once. But having some regular practice of confession is a good thing. It, it, the classic line is, for Anglicans, is all may, some should, none must. That's sort of the classic line. And, that, and what that means is that all are permitted to come to confession. Some really should come to confession and none must come to confession. None are compelled to go to confession against their will. That is not, there are no, we, we do, it actually, the prayer book does say you need to take communion three times a year to be a communicant in good standing. There's nothing about a required confession to be a communicant in good standing. So none must, I think that is really important. All may, I think that is really important. The one thing I'll say about that venerable Anglican phrase, all may, some should, none must, is that I've, I have, a, I've, 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 had a hard time figuring out who are the some who shouldn't is sort of my like <laughs> my issue. I'm like try, who are the I mean I, I'm sure some don't need to. That's no doubt true, but I'm not sure that even those people shouldn't if that makes sense. So my tendency is to say all may all probably should really to be honest, but none must. And that is the classic Anglican line. So fourth block of of an Anglican rule of life is confession. If you haven't practiced confession in the past, then then you would want to talk through that process rather than just showing up maybe and, and, and doing your best at it. You want to meet with Father Ralph or I or, or any, of the, any of the priests here or uh, Bishop Grundorf and, and sort out what does that actually look like. Re a, a common way, people who, who practice confession regularly once a month is, a, is kind of a good standard, but doing it once every two months or three months is fine. Even once a year, that's pretty, that's, hard, that's not that much. <laughs> I don't know. That's pretty far, far apart. Uh, more than once a month is usually not, uh, outside of special circumstances, is, is, is probably too much, but not necessarily. And as often, I mean, this is the prayer book standard, as often as needed, which is, when is it needed? It's needed when you cannot quiet your conscience otherwise. That's what the prayer book says in two different places. If, you, if, you're, if your conscience is troubled and you can't quiet it in any other way, then you should go receive a sacramental absolution from a priest. You don't, you don't to be clear, you don't need it to be forgiven. Nobody teaches that. The Roman Catholic Church does not teach that you need a priestly absolution for, for forgiveness. True penitence receives God's forgiveness. Just Roman Catholics would say that true penitence would be followed by going to, to a priest when you could. But nobody teaches that God withholds forgiveness until you're in the presence of a priest. That is not a Christian teaching. 
anywhere, anytime, except I'm sure some heretics. But, but other than that, not taught. Okay, last thing to say, last sentence, is that the Lenten disciplines of fasting, almsgiving, and prayer are within the context of an, of an Anglican rule of life. And so the, the vision for, that Thornton has, or that the church has, is that you are adding them to an existing rule of life. And so if you don't have a rule of life, then step one is to form a rule of life. And you all do, because I know you all attempt to be at church on Sunday, even if you're not there every Sunday. I see you often enough to know that you like to come to church on Sunday. So all of you have a rule of life, whether you consciously realize it or not, right? I would say try to, try to come to church on Sundays. Say the daily office in one form or another, and engage in some level of personal prayer, and add to those things fasting and almsgiving. Those things are prayer, so you, you, know, so you, already, so you already got one. There you go. And don't do them in lieu of the others. Does that make sense? Instead of the others. So my advice to you in the next week is to make your Lenten commitment on Sunday. When you see that bulletin insert, you can use that or you can do it on your own. So before, before next Wednesday, figure out what am I, I going to choose to do this Lent. And again, I should say, Will, Father Wilcox says this right away. The goal of Lent is to sin less and to become closer to Jesus, which is one and the same thing. When you stop sinning, then you, you, are, you are being drawn closer to Christ. That's the point. And so if Lenten disciplines get in the way of those things, then you should absolutely not do them. So just that's your statement about that. So make your Lenten commitment. My suggestion is that over the next five days, you try to read 20 pages a day and, and finish the book. 94 pages, you can do it. And then the following re week, reread pages 9 through 29 using the reading guide on the back. That's my advice. There may or may not be a quiz, but so I'm just advising you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who pourest out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and of supplication, deliver us when we draw nigh to thee from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections we may worship thee in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.